Uh, thank you, uh, President Spellings, uh, Mr. Chairman, and members of the board for inviting me. Very happy to be here today. I'd also like to thank, in particular, Leslie Boney and Aaron Hopper uh, for reaching out and with whom I've had some great conversations uh, over the last couple of weeks about university economic engagement. I'm pleased to talk with you today about what we're learning about universities and economic impact. I read the March report to the UNC General Administration from the Boston Consulting Group, and it's no <coughs> surprise to me that economic impact emerged as a top theme for UNC strategic priorities. People want to know more about how we in higher education, and especially perhaps in public higher education, are making a difference in society, and an interest in economic impact is an opportunity for us to tell that story. Uh, Today, I'll use the phrase uh, economic engagement a lot. Uh, in the work that I do with universities, we talk a lot about economic impact, in particular the difficulties in measuring impact, and I'll talk more about that later. But we probably spend more time on the idea of economic engagement, which is the idea that universities develop mutually beneficial, reciprocal partnerships with business and industry, government, and community organizations in order to achieve the shared economic and social objectives among these organizations. We focus on economic engagement because what we know is that without such engagement, there, there will be no impact. So I'll tell you first a little bit about uh, APLU. Uh, our membership reaches across North America with members in every US state and in Canada and Mexico. Uh, we have a diverse membership. About 200 of our members are individual campuses in varying contexts and institutional missions. The seven member campuses in North Carolina represent this diversity, uh, the diversity of the broader uh, APLU membership. And that diversity is a huge asset for APLU in undertaking the work that I'm going to describe today because it takes a range of assets and missions to have an economic impact. UNC, be UNC benefits uh, from an even greater diversity than we do at APLU because you have institutions that have even smaller research enterprises and more of an emphasis on teaching and learning and community outreach. So for example, the Western Carolinas and the Appalachian states play a huge role in the kind of economic engagement I'm going to talk about today, even though those kinds of institutions aren't members of APLU. Uh, there, are just over, there are also just over 30 university system offices that are members of the association. Uh, on behalf of our members, we conduct research and policy analysis and advocate for federal programs that support scientific research and other higher education issues. Uh, we work with Congress and the federal government in doing that advocacy. Uh, in addition to the DC-based policy work, though, we also focus efforts on supporting the development and implementation of institutional level policy. Uh, and uh, Generally, our work in, uh, here with our institutions focuses on these three pillars, increasing degree completion and academic success, advancing scientific research, and expanding engagement. And I head up the Office of Economic Development and Community Engagement, and our focus is on that third pillar of uh, expanding engagement. These aren't silos, though. Our work in my office also extends to the degree completion and research pillars. It's just that uh, we see those activities through the engagement lens. Uh, and so my office convenes two of APLU's member groups. One is called the Council on Engagement and Outreach, or CEO, we call it. Um, and that uh, is uh, leaders from our campuses that uh, do a lot of community development, community partnerships, and so forth. Uh, and I also convene our Commission on Innovation, Competitiveness, and Economic Prosperity, uh, or CICEP as we call it for short, and we need a short name for that one. Um, and CICEP convenes folks who are uh, sort of heading up economic development and economic engagement activities on our, our member campuses. In CICEP, we've developed a framework for our efforts uh, which are aimed at bolstering university commitment to economic engagement. And the first part of the framework is presented here. We believe that universities must first know well what they are doing in economic engagement. What are the programs and practices that help the university be connected to their region in this way and have impact? We also believe that universities should find ways to measure these activities and, importantly, their outcomes. They should also be able to tell the story of economic engagement and impact. And finally, universities should develop the capacity to do all of these things in an engaged manner, knowing, measuring, and telling through interaction with both internal and external stakeholders. Um, and, and this is a very important, the engaged piece is a very important part of this framework and how our universities do this work. 
The second part of our framework encourages universities to define broadly the work of economic engagement, taking into account an array of institutional activities and an equally broad array of economic and societal outcomes. We use this Venn diagram to describe university contributions to the, economies, to the economy. Universities develop talent, creating the human capital needed for the 21st century economy. Ask any one of uh, the chancellors sitting right here or any other university what their institution does for economic development, and they'll likely answer by saying graduation. Uh, it's the main thing that universities do to help economies and communities thrive. Uh, universities also contribute to economies through innovation and entrepreneurship, though, tapping the riches of science by working to bring discoveries to market. And importantly, universities also cultivate what we call place development. This is about bringing the social, cultural, and community assets to bear on creating great places to work and live. Not necessarily what we always think of as economic development, but what we've learned a vital foundation for prosperity. These aren't unique ideas, obviously, talent, innovation, and place. In fact, Leslie tells me that President Spellings uses a similar framework to talk about the promise of the University of North Carolina, uh, that its contributions through development of people or talent, uh, development of research and scholarship, which are certainly the starting point for innovation, and improving culture and health of the cities and regions that surround us, which we would call place development. It's important, though, to note that our presentation of these ideas is a Venn diagram uh, for a reason, it's intentional. Uh, talent, innovation, and place are parts, and the sum is greater than the whole. We encourage universities to work at these areas of overlap, uh, to find, uh, uh, at, at the areas of, these over, uh, of the overlap in these contributions, because we believe that in doing so, universities and their stakeholders will achieve a greater scale of impact in economic engagement. So developing the framework has led us to the creation of four tools. Uh, I understand you have copies of one of these, uh, the Foundations for Strategy and Practice uh, tool that we developed. And here's a web address where you can uh, go and check out the other three and download them if you like. I'll quickly tell you about these tools. The Foundations for Strategy and Practice, this is a tool uh, in a publication that we developed in partnership with the University Economic Development Association, another organization that's very much uh, interested in this kind of work. And in this publication, we detail the framework I've just described, and we provide a taxonomy of university programs and activities that fit into the framework, including those all important areas of overlap. Uh, the second tool is a pair of assessment tools. This is a couple of surveys that university economic engagement leaders can deploy with both internal and external stakeholders to gauge the institution's economic engagement efforts. The survey identifies about 40 characteristics of what we would call an economically engaged institution, and each characteristic has two scales in the survey. Uh, one is, how well are we doing this? Uh, but importantly, the second scale has to do with how important is this to us? Uh, and so using the combination of the data on those two surveys, institutions get a real clear sense of where the gaps are in their economic engagement enterprise. We also developed a new metrics field guide. We, uh, our, our commission convened national and local stakeholders for over three years to develop guidelines about the kinds of things institutions should measure. I'll talk more about metrics and measurement a little later, but what we did with this tool is laid out a set of measures that universities might consider when talking with stakeholders about institutional contributions to economic development. And finally, we uh, developed a set of economic impact guidelines. This tool is focused on helping university economic engagement leaders undertake thoughtful and accurate economic impact studies, and it encourages universities to not just do sort of the traditional economic impact study, but take a, a, a look at a wide array of university contributions to the economy. So after developing these tools, in order to make sure that they didn't just sit on the virtual shelf, we developed a program to engage member institutions in applying the tools to defining, assessing, and improving economic engagement work at their campuses. So through the program, universities apply the principles in the framework to an assessment of their economic engagement efforts. Institutions are required to engage both internal and external stakeholders in this process. Uh, among other work, they identify areas of accomplishment and, as, and also areas for growth and improvement. And importantly, they also provide evidence that they have for those areas of accomplishment and areas for improvement. They have to demonstrate how they know what they're doing well and what they need to do better. A panel of reviewers reads the applications for the designation and makes recommendations regarding whether the institution should be designated. 
Now, when an institution does fail to earn the designation, we encourage them to come back and try again after addressing concerns of the reviewers. Our goal here is to catalyze commitment to economic engagement work, and we want to work with institutions to help them get designated so that we can keep them engaged in that work. Uh, once an institution is designated, they're eligible to apply for an awards program, and you'll hear uh, a little bit about some of our award winners in a few minutes. Uh, two UNC institutions, East Carolina University and North Carolina State, have earned the designation, and State went on to win one of the Innovation and Economic Prosperity Universities awards. So what I'd like to do now is just provide some examples of what this talent, innovation, and place framework looks like in action. Uh, I've so far resisted calling the framework uh, the TIP or TIP framework because I get tired of acronyms working in Washington, uh, but you all work for universities, so you get tired of them too. Um, although the folks at NC State may, uh, may change my mind on this, their Office of Outreach and Engagement has really embraced the framework as a central organizing tool for some of their efforts, and they frequently uh, talk to me about the TIP framework, and it takes me a little while <laughs> uh, to catch on to what they're talking about. So some of the examples I'm going to give about what talent innovation in place looks like come from institutions that have achieved the designee status in our program and that have gone on to win awards for their work. Uh, and I hope to demonstrate with the range of examples that university economic engagement isn't just something that big research universities do, that universities of all types make these kinds of contributions. And this has actually been a challenge for us in this program, is recognizing the diversity of institutions and having standards that actually work across those. But as President Spe Spelling said earlier, we really do have to be aware of the distinctions among our institutions and the kinds of contributions that they make. And so we've been very careful to try and do that. So my first example is from North Carolina A&T uh, University. Um, and I've included uh, this example, and in the example of the illustration that this, this, this example really shows us what, it ha what happens when you take the talent and innovation pieces and link and leverage across them. Uh, a &T's Center for Entrepreneurship and Innovation serves as a hub for commercialization of university technology and also the development of entrepreneurs. And one of the interesting things, uh, Wayne Safransky from North Carolina a and is on uh, the uh, executive committee for our, our, my commission, and I always enjoy talking with him about what's going on there. One of the interesting things is that uh, technology transfer and entrepreneurship are not divorced uh, at a and And that happens at a lot of our institutions. We have folks working on tech transfer, but then we have a whole bunch of other people thinking about what makes for good entrepreneurship. But at a and those, those come together. Uh, there's an entrepreneur in residence program that engages students in learning about entrepreneurship from entrepreneurs and, and also benefiting both the academic and research enterprises. And undergraduates are active in a, a, a program called the VentureWell Innov Innovation Fellows Program. Uh, and this group um, has done a lot of work to uh, enliven the uh, entrepreneurial enterprise on campus, including doing a study aimed at creating maker spaces on campus. So um, they're very active, and uh, I think it's a good example of how you can leverage across talent and innovation. Clemson University uh, is one of our IEP universities and an award winner in that program. They won the award for uh, talent development. Uh, their, their International Center for Automotive Research, or ICAR creates a sh uh, shared space for industry professionals, students, and faculty. So in the same facility, corporate engineers and researchers work side by side with learners and researchers from the university. ICAR brings together innovation with talent development by bringing together industry and the university under one roof. Uh, um, and the next example, also from North Carolina, focused on supporting innovation, uh, is um, and in particular, moving research discoveries to market. So Carolina's Express License Program, which is a, a standard license agreement for UNC startups, makes the best possible deal available to entrepreneurs working uh, to commercialize discoveries from Carolina li laboratories. The Express <coughs> License helps accelerate innovation and technology transfer by making it easier for entrepreneurs to get going on developing the product rather than getting bogged down with licensing fees and complex negotiation. And you know, this, the world of tech transfer is, an, is a world that we need to do more. Uh, the governor uh, implored uh, uh, us earlier to show, us the innovate, show him the innovation. Uh, we actually have to do a lot of work to show folks innovation in how we manage innovation at our institutions. And I think the Carolina Express license is a good example of uh, that kind of innovation. Uh, another uh, example, this one from another IEP-designated university, also focused on innovation. Um, 
The University of Minnesota's Min Drive program aligns areas of university research strengths with the state's key and emerging industries, addressing grand challenges in robotics, food, and the environment, and also brain conditions. And this is not just about research projects, though. They're also about industry partnerships. Such partnerships are a key element of each of the collaborative and interdisciplinary <laughs> research projects that go through this program. So from the beginning, industry is involved, and so that structure leads not only to high quality research, but also accelerated innovation because industry is there from the beginning of the research project. Coming back to North Carolina, uh, linking and leveraging across innovation and place. Uh, NC State was designated an IEP university in 2014 and in that year won the award for place development for the contributions to economic development made by State Centennial Campus. As you likely know, Centennial Campus is a place where research and industry partnerships are tightly coupled. Uh, innovative facilities, including Hunt Library, uh, catalyze collaboration and innovative problem solving. So interestingly, uh, place development as an idea has uh, been defined in multiple ways by our institutions as they go through this program. Sometimes focused like this on creating places like Centennial Campus that help catalyze innovative and entrepreneurship, uh, innovation and entrepreneurship efforts. Other places like at Auburn University uh, the place development definition focuses on the idea that universities help create great communities where people want to work and live. Uh, and, and so this example from Auburn, I think, fits a little bit more into sort of a community development uh, model and way of thinking about place. Uh, Auburn University was designated last year and won the award uh, uh, for um, place. Uh, Auburn's Rural Studio Project links and leverages university assets across talent development and place development by sending undergraduate architecture students into the community to undertake design build projects for the underserved population of rural West Alabama. Students get hands-on learning and communities get the benefit of good design and construction. One of Rural Studio's projects was the creation of a $20,000 house, a small house that can be built for less than $20,000 uh, worth of materials. And for one final example, let's come back to North Carolina. I like this example because it really demonstrates how you can link and leverage across all of those categories of talent, innovation, and place. East Carolina School of Dental Medicine has established community service learning centers across the state where dental students hone their clinical skills, applying the latest technology and knowledge being developed uh, at and used by the School of Dental Medicine while providing desperately needed healthcare services in rural areas. Economic, doesn't, economic development doesn't matter if your community isn't healthy. So ECU's community service learning centers represent an important economic engagement activity. So I said that I would talk a little bit about the, challenge is, the challenges of measurement. Uh, our Commission on Innovation started with a charge, really, uh, when the Commission was started to find better ways to measure the ways in which university, uh, universities engage in economic development and to do a good job of telling the story of that work. So this has been a real central interest for the commission and a significant part of our efforts. And there are big challenges here, like I said. Uh, I'd like to talk about a few of them by way of context for a broader discussion about how the university system can encourage and support university economic engagement. So first, we have traditionally defined university economic impact. Uh, we've traditionally defined it in a somewhat narrow and circumscribed way. The starting point for any university economic impact study and report is spending. How big is the university's payroll and how much does it spend on goods and services? There's a significant impact here, to be sure. I mean, many uh, of your universities, for example, are the largest employers in their region. Um, and I know that there was the 2015 study uh, by EMSI uh, for UNC that the governor mentioned earlier today, and it demonstrated very clearly this kind of impact. Um, uh, the number, I think, was uh, just over 27 or almost 30 or tw almost 28 billion dollars in added income to the state. But universities really do so much more for economies than just spend money, right? So uh, um, as I've been illustrating, universities generate innovation and entrepreneurial opportunities, they address labor market needs through talent development, and they create great places to work and live. But how do we measure all of those contributions so we can define impact more broadly? And that's an open question. Another challenge that we deal with in measuring impact is that uh, the challenge arises when we try to move beyond a spending frame for economic uh, impact and look at the fact, and, and we start to look at the fact that many of the economic benefits of universities are not immediate. 
So research undertaken at universities, especially in fields like life sciences, can take years and massive additional investments uh, before commercialization can happen. So the full economic contribution of our graduates also, or the work that we do in communities, can also take time to be realized. Uh, and measuring things over time can try the patience of policymakers and tax the systems that universities have in place to uh, capture data and, and uh, analyze it. So another challenge that comes up is how direct uh, are those contributions. So if the path is long from university output to economic impact, it's also indirect. Universities alone, in many cases, cannot realize the benefits of all of their assets. We rely on partners in government, nonprofits, and business and industry to help us turn intellectual assets into economic prosperity and well-being. So the term collective impact is used to describe this kind of indirect path. And while the idea of collective impact is powerful, a powerful representation of how impact happens, it also suggests a tracking challenge. How do we follow these indirect paths to fully understand the role of individual players in creating economic and social outcomes? Again, this kind of challenge frustrates policymakers and taxes our systems. Unfortunately, despite our efforts to address the measurement challenge, we don't have complete answers. Uh, uh, one of the great things, though, about the Innovation and Economic Prosperity Universities program is that we're seeing institutions focus on measurement. They're trying to identify the right evidence for their accomplishment and, uh, accomplishments and areas for growth. And the program encourages development of a culture of evidence, and institutions are engaging in new ways with stakeholders to identify the right evidence and indicators and to capture better data about what works. I said earlier that without engagement, there is no impact. And we're also learning that without engagement, there is no meaningful measurement of impact. So which leads to me to some final thoughts. Uh, in, our, in our conversations over the last few weeks, uh, Leslie Boney uh, has encouraged me to talk a little bit about the role of university systems in all of this. And to be honest, I, f I felt least confident about this part of my talk. I interact with individual universities much more than I do with system offices. But I did a little research, did some reflection on what I've observed about systems and economic engagement, and came up with a few thoughts on this front. So here's, here's what I have. First, uh, as system offices turn their attention to encouraging and supporting individual campuses to become more economically engaged, I think that they need to see their uh, contribution as one of more of facilitator than of regulator or allocator. So the system really has to facilitate this kind of work across the state and not sort of uh, push regulation in to make it happen. Economic engagement is highly context sensitive. Just as we have to recognize that our institutions are all distinct and they have distinct missions, we have to realize that those contexts mean means that the way we do economic engagement is sensitive to those uh, distinctions. There's no one size fits all, fits all approach. So system offices must facilitate the work rather than regulate or manage it. In the world of technology-based economic development, we talk a lot about ecosystems. The idea is that organizations do not make economic development happen all by themselves. There are complex and dynamic networks and interactions at play. This is also true of economic engagement, and a system role in this work is helping to build those ecosystems, helping to make connections across campuses and between campuses and others. Uh, and in being an ecosystem builder, the system also plays a role as an intermediary, which is another uh, important role and also a role that we talk a lot about in tech-based economic development. System offices can convene campuses and connect them with stakeholders in state government, the civic sector, and in business and industry. So acting as that mediator between the universities and other players is a, a very helpful role for the system. Um, also in this convening role, systems can see broadly where the assets are and help align university assets with state needs. So, and importantly, system office can help at a statewide level align the resources necessary to fulfill the promise of these assets. So doing strategic resource planning uh, uh, becomes vital um, in terms of reflecting back on all of what we said about institutions being distinct <laughs> and having distinct assets. We have to understand how those as assets align with uh, what the needs are in the state. And alignment of resources is related to another important system role, uh, helping us to be good stewards of public money by setting benchmarks and standards for quality and outcomes, and importantly, helping make measurement happen. So we've talked a lot about these challenges of measurement. I think that overcoming these challenges can really only happen at scale, and system offices have the ability to bring scale to measurement. Um, 
Speaking of scaling, I was talking with a friend and colleague about the role of systems, and he shared for me what was a new way of thinking about scale. Uh, the colleague had worked at the National Association of System Heads, an organization for people in the role that President Spellings is in. And in his work at Nash, my friend Jonathan learned about scaling out versus scaling up. Scaling up means focusing on individual units and building their capacity. Individual campuses need to be able to scale up solutions they find working for their students and other stakeholders. System offices, on the other hand, need to focus their energies on scaling out, building capacity across institutions by helping to transfer the ideas that are working on one campus across other campuses. But importantly, scaling out isn't just picking up best practices in one place and plopping them down in another. Uh, it's about holding up these best practices example, as examples and then doing the harder work of translating and adapting them across different contexts, communities, and missions. So to finish up, just a couple of quick examples of the system role. Uh, first, the State University of New York, uh, at the State University of New York, Chancellor Zimfer talks about systemness. Uh, the idea that the 64 campuses of that system, including everything from community colleges to research intensive universities, can do much more together than the sum of what they can all do individually. So implementation of Chancellor, Zimf Chancellor Zimfer's systemness concept uh, means leveraging the strengths of individual campuses and making those assets available across the system. So when you take the idea of systemness and combine it to the broad concept of economic engagement I've talked about today, you begin to see how facilitation of share and sharing of assets across institutions within a system can be a powerful economic driver. Some institutions, because of their context, community, or mission, are going to have stronger assets in either their talent, innovate, talent development, innovation, or place development uh, capacities. Uh, or they might be doing better in linking and leveraging across two of those areas than, than others. Um, across multiple campuses, though, you begin, to get, you begin to develop a tremendous strength across all of the categories and achieve the highest level of connectedness. Uh, my second example comes from my experience studying the University of Massachusetts, which I did for my, my doctoral research. The title of my dissertation was Wilson's Mantra, and then there were a bunch of gobbledygook uh, academic words after a colon. Uh, but Wilson's Mantra referred to the then system president, Jack Wilson. And throughout the interviews I conducted for my research across multiple UMass campuses and with state stakeholders, many people mentioned that President Wilson, when, whenever he gave a talk, would say, the path to economic and social development in Massachusetts runs through UMass. And what happened was that as he put this image out there, leaders on individual campuses started to try and figure out what that meant for them and how they would live up to this idea. President Wilson was telling an overarching story, a kind of transcendent narrative that the institutions then began to enact. Of course, President Wilson did a number of other things to encourage the effort, including uh, convening people across campuses to work on research and economic development collaborations and establishing a science and technology fund to uh, encourage the kind of work that would lead to the outcomes he was envisioning. But I think the important element about the UMass example is this idea that the system office was telling the story of the identity of the collective university. And that story inspired collective work among the campuses to realize the vision. So with regard to UNC and economic development, I think it's about figuring out what story you want to tell and then helping campuses see and enact their roles in that story. And I'll look forward to seeing how that proceeds. And I thank you very much for inviting me to be part of the conversation. Thank you.